Peace of Christ be with you. Uh, you may be seated. Normally we pass the peace to everybody, but these days we're not interacting. I want to welcome you to our service of worship this morning and welcome people not only who are in the pew, but people who are watching uh, online, people from First Church, from Westmount Presbyterian Church, from parts of the province and parts of the country, and we hope you feel the love of Jesus as we minister today. I have a couple of announcements, and the first is, um, I'm not sure I sent out the right bulletin, <laughs> uh, or the right bulletin was sent out. Uh, the bulletin goes through a process of editing, and I send it to Marnie and Joachim and back to me and to a proofreader and whatever. I'm not sure the final form got out to you. So we did try and send that final form out this morning, uh, shortly before 11. So you may be able to check your computer and get the final one. If not, you just will have to bear with us. There's a couple of the hymns. We took out a couple of verses. I don't think the introit and the extroit's there. Uh, Ron Long's going to be singing uh, a nice solo, Rejoice the, Lord of King, the Rejoice the Lord is King, and I'm not sure that made it into the earlier bulletin, but just follow along. I'm sure it'll, it'll all work out. And next week, we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion, so we will have the elements already out for those who are here at church um, so that the, you know, we don't have to pass and touch. And we ask those who are at home that uh, if you would like to participate, and that's totally up to you how you feel about online communion, but if you'd like to participate, that you get your wine or juice or bread ready 
uh, for the communion before the service starts and you'll be all ready to participate with us next Sunday, which is the first Sunday of the church year, the first Sunday in Advent. And thank you. And uh, lead on, eternal sovereign, we follow in your way. Loud rings your cry for justice, your call for peace this day. Through prayerful preparation, your grace has made us strong to carry on the struggle to triumph over wrong. Let us worship God. Our hymn is 267, Rejoice the Lord is King. Prayers of approach are printed in the bulletin, and we say the prayers together in unison. Let us pray. God, this is the day we celebrate Jesus as King and Lord and what that means. It means that we will obey him and follow him and serve him. But Jesus is not a king like other kings. Jesus is a king of love, a good shepherd, and a servant of all. And so we confess to the one who is King and Lord, yet who intercedes on our behalf about what we are. We are not the people we like others to think we are. We are afraid to admit, even to ourselves, what lies at the depths of our souls. We have failed in our calling to be your holy people, a people set apart by hope for your purposes of justice and healing. We live more in apathy born of fatalism than in passion born of hope. We are moved more by private ambition than by social justice. We dream more of privilege and benefits than of service of sacrifice. We shape our hearts and lives for your kingdom that we can live and move and dream according to that hope to which you have called us. Forgive us 
revive us and mold us in the image of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. God is love and sent the King of love to be our servant. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, children of all ages. You know, most of us want to help Jesus. And sometimes the best way to help Jesus is when you don't know that you're helping Jesus. That's because Jesus says, when you help others, you help me. So if a child's hungry at school, and doesn't have any lunch, 
and you take one of your sandwiches and you give a sandwich to that hungry child, even though you don't know you're helping Jesus, you're helping Jesus. If a child at school is being bullied and you step in and say, don't do this, this is wrong, or you go get a teacher to help, then by helping the child who's being bullied, even though you don't know you're helping Jesus, you're helping Jesus. If there's a child that falls down at school and hurts himself, and you help them, you get a Band-Aid, or you take them to the school nurse, then even though you don't know you're helping Jesus, you're helping Jesus. If there's a new child, and this child's come from another country and doesn't speak English very well, and they're scared and lonely, and you think that they need a friend, so you become a friend to them. Even though you don't know you're helping Jesus, you're becoming a friend to Jesus. Because Jesus says, inasmuch as you do it unto the least of my family, my human family, you're doing it to me. Our hymn is 273, Jesus, our mighty Lord. Responsive psalm today is Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7a, and we're today we're we're going to have the second refrain psalm. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great sovereign above all gods. In whose hand are the depths of the earth and also the heights of the mountains. The sea belongs to God who made it and the dry land. 
which, which God's, God's hand has set forth. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pastures, and the sheep of God's hand. reading from the Old Testament, from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, uh, beginning at chapter 34, verses 11 to 16 and 20 to 24. Hear the word of God. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they've been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the water courses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. And a reading from the epistles, from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, 15 to 23. Hear the word of God. <clears throat> I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he's called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head of o over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And a reading from the Gospels, from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the nations one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. 
Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous nations will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then those nations also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Praise God for the reading of God's word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable In your sight, O Lord, our rescuer, our rock. Amen. There was a story in the news the other day here in Edmonton. It caught my attention. A local boy, Grayson Borosiak, had a birthday wish. His wish was that for his 10th birthday, he would help donate 100 pizzas Ten for each year of his life to Boyle Street Community Services. Boyle Street Community Services is an Edmonton agency that supports those experiencing homelessness and poverty. Now, Grayson got the idea when there was hockey here in Edmonton a few months ago, and the Las Vegas Golden Knights bought pizza for the Boyle Street Community Services five separate times, and they made pizza available to the poor and homeless of the city. So he asked people, instead of presents, to donate pizzas to Boyle Street for the poor and homeless. And this came on just about the time I was reading the scripture for this week. And I thought, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my human family, you did it to me. So I thought, Grayson's not only giving pizza to the poor and homeless, He's giving pizza to Jesus. Now, Grayson probably wasn't thinking that. In fact, if we were to commend him for giving pizza to Jesus, he probably would say, when did I give pizza to Jesus? And that's the point, isn't it? Jesus says that you give it to him when you don't think you're giving it to him and you just think you're helping out somebody in need or somebody forgotten or somebody left out by society. Our scripture today is often called the parable of the sheep and the goats. And it has inspired people in many ways over the years to do different things. And one inspiration of that is a current Canadian story of Canadian sculptor Timothy Schmaltz, who designed and cast a sculpture called Homeless Jesus, based on this very parable, the sheep and the goats. And it depicts a homeless person sleeping on a park bench, The homeless person's face and hands are obscured, hidden by an old blanket the the homeless person is wrapped up in. But the only way to tell it's Jesus is there are crucifixion wounds on the two feet sticking out of the blanket. The first cast was offered to two big cathedrals, first in Canada and then in the United States. They declined the statue. So the first one was put at Regis College, the Jesuit School of Theology of Theology at the University of Toronto. But more casts were made, and now over a hundred casts of this sculpture have appeared 
all over the world. And it's said that the Pope's reaction when he saw this statue was to get down on his knees, touch it, and pray. But not everybody has a positive reaction to it. But the sculpture makes us think, who is Jesus? Where is Jesus in this world? What kind of king is Jesus who eats pizza with the homeless and sleeps on a park bench? What does it mean to be servants of this king? And what does the rule of Jesus really mean? We might contrast the kingship of Jesus to that of other royals of our day and age. Two and a half years ago, almost two billion people tuned in to watch the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And in Britain and around the world, watching the British royals is, a, is an industry all by itself. And while the British royal family is very wealthy, and the royal women are noted for new outfits almost every week, and while many of these royals are adored, we have found out that being a royal is no picnic. It's hard work. There's little privacy. Harry and Meghan themselves have opted out of royal life and its demands. But the royals of whom we know are a far cry from the homeless eating pizza at Boyle Street or the homeless sleeping on a park bench or the homeless who actually sleep just outside our church very frequently. Every once in a while, Norm takes a cup of coffee to the homeless who are sleeping outside our church, who often mess it up, sometimes even vandalize our church. But we must remember that inasmuch as Norm gives a copy to the least of the members of our human family, he's giving a cup of coffee to Jesus. The parable of the sheep and goats is a difficult and demanding parable. The shift in this parable is one that I like, but there's a part of the parable on the surface I don't like. The shift in the parable is a criteria for making the separation. For many of us brought up, brought up in Christianity, or even brought up in our version of Christianity, the Reformed branch of the church, the important part of Christianity is faith or belief. It said we had to believe in Jesus. We had to have faith in Jesus. And often that meant we had to believe certain things about Jesus, like believe he rose from death, believe he was born of a virgin, believe that he performed miracles. And some of these things have been questioned by science or by modern scholarship or even by liberal theologians. Maybe you question some of them. And sometimes the answer what was given was, even though there are things that are hard to believe, you have to have faith. That's what it's all about, believing in things that are hard to believe. And yet along comes this parable about separating people into two sides, sheep and goats. And the parable makes a distinction. The sheep are the good ones, the bad goats are the bad ones, and the criteria is how you treat the poor, the refugees, the sick, and the prisoners. Now some people say, some theologians have said, that this isn't actually a parable at all. It's actually about the end of the world and what will literally happen in the future, that God or Jesus, the king, will actually separate all people. Some will go to heaven, some will go to hell, and it's a story about what the, not about what the reign of God is like, but a literal story of what will happen in the end. If this were so, according to the criteria, then Muslims, Jews, atheists, Hindus, Sikhs, all kinds of people would be judged not by their faith or believing in Jesus, but on the basis of whether they help the poor, the refugee, the sick, and the prisoner. And there's a side of me that likes the fact that the emphasis here is on love and compassion for the needy. What I don't like in the parable is this whole separating thing. I've been saying for weeks as we've going through the Gospel of Matthew, and this is the last week uh, in Pentecost, so next year we start a different gospel to emphasize on, but we've been going through Matthew's gospel, and we've been talking about the conflict between Jesus and the leader of the Jews, the leaders of the Jews, 
And they have a very strict understanding of whom God will bless and whom God will curse, whom God will reward, whom God will punish. And Jesus points to a very different vision than they have. And his vision is that grace goes out to all, even the undeserving. And frankly, most of us fit in that category of undeserving. It might be actually scary to think how many of us Christians would be on the side of the goats in a literal reading of this parable. If Jesus were to separate us into sheep and goats, and I include myself as one who talks a lot about caring for the least of these, but like many people has trouble at times doing it, how much do we have to share and give to actually make it to the sheep side and not be on the goat side? Help a poor person once, visit a prisoner twice, help three refugees, care for four sick people. Do we have to give a certain percent of our income to the poor to make it to the sheep side? Nobody knows, and if you're like me, you wonder, how much would be enough, and have I done enough to make it to the sheep side and not the goat side? But I think it's a parable. I don't think it's a literal representation of what will happen actually happened that last day. I think God's grace is bigger than this story, but I also think our sin is just as big as this story. And it's hard to say who would actually be able to stand up to the scrutiny of God and not end up on the goat side, except for the grace and mercy of God. But one interpretive note that I think we should make is the fact that newer translations actually translate the scripture, I might say, wrongly or differently. Listen to how the New Revised Standard Version has the second line. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people, one from the other, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The word I'm referring to is people. The New International Version is he will separate the people. And the good news, the people of all nations. But in the original Greek, the word is autos. It's a pronoun meaning them. The King James Version, the Revised Standard Version, translate it more literally. And this is what it says when it's translated more literally. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate them one from another. Who's gathered before the king? The nations, and he will separate them. Who is them? The nations. So I actually read the parable when I read it today differently. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the nations one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. And it makes a big difference if we use the word people. It sounds like the king is separating individual people based on the criteria, criteria of how they help the least. But if you use the pronoun them, then the separation is about the nations being separated. And why is this so important? Because while it does matter what we do individually... When Jesus speaks truth to power, he's often critical of the institutions. Jesus is wrestling against the principalities and powers, and not against individual flesh and blood humans, but the institutions like the Roman religious and political system, the Jewish religious and political system, which as institutions were often biased against the poor, the foreigner, the sick, and the ones who'd done wrong. So we can interpret the parable as a criticism of all institutions that fail the weak, the vulnerable, and the least in our cultures and societies. And case in point, we in Canada don't have to look very far to what has happened in our nursing homes and our care homes since the pandemic. 
Is not Jesus lying in hundreds of hospital beds all over Canada, not being visited, not necessarily receiving adequate care, a victim of systems ill-prepared for COVID, and at times unwilling to invest the money into the proper care of the sick and elderly in our society? Is not Jesus lying in the streets homeless in the city of Edmonton, and indeed all over our country and all over this world? Is not Jesus languishing in prison under conditions that, contrary to popular belief, are nothing like club med, but are often dehumanizing and dangerous, more so since the coronavirus seems to have the ability to rip through institutions like prisons? Is not Jesus at great risk in our immigrant or newcomer populations who often have low-paying jobs, service jobs, where they have to go to work? They can't stay home and work from home, and they're at greater risk of getting the virus. So we can read the parable as a lesson for us as individuals to help the poor, the weak, the lonely, and the forgotten. But we can also read it as a criticism of our financial, political, health, educational, social, military, and religious systems that often favor the strong and have prejudice against minorities and the poor and the vulnerable and the criminal. And yet I will remind you that it's also a parable. Sometimes a parable is not about us. It's more about what it says about God or Jesus or the Spirit. This parable says a lot about who Jesus is. Jesus is alive. At Easter, when I preach at Easter, I often talk about Jesus being alive, that Jesus is risen and lives in the lives of those who follow his way of love and acceptance. That the resurrection is not just a doctrine, but it's also an event where Jesus is born anew in us, and we begin to live like Jesus. But this parable points out that Jesus is not only in the ones who love, but in the ones who need love. And the ones who need love are not always nice and wonderful people. Because we have 2,000 years been removed from Jesus, the ones Jesus mentioned, the sick, the foreigners, the poor, and the prisoner, in Jesus' day were often considered the bad ones, the worthless ones, the ones cursed by God, the unclean ones. They were not just poor unfortunates in the eyes of the people of Jesus' day. They were basically the bad who deserved it. And so when we read the parable, we must not forget that Jesus is not just talking about innocent people. Innocent sick people and refugees and poor people. People we, these days, have natural compassion for. But Jesus is found in people who don't deserve him. The crabby the criminal, the person who is poor because they've actually made evil and wrong choices, the drug dealer and abuser, the people who are in prison because they jolly well earned it by doing horrible things to other people. Think of the worst people you can think of, and if they need help, Jesus is there too. And I don't like it. But in other words, In a parable about separating nations or people into sheep or goats, the criteria seems to be the sheep are the ones who help the goats. So there's another way to read this parable. It's a kind of tongue-in-cheek parable about the way we humans love to separate people into sheep and goats. The sheep are the good people. The goats are the bad people. We all know who the good people are and the bad people are. But Jesus takes this common understanding of who the good and the bad are. And then he says, the good are the ones who help the bad and include them in the kingdom. And the bad people aren't bad. They just need grace. Jesus turns the whole system on its head. The ones everybody thought were the bad ones cursed by God are actually God's children. Jesus even calls them family. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to the one of least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. The prisoners are members of God's family, of Jesus' family. So the truth may just be this, that every one of us 
are in need of grace. All of us are sick. All of us at times are strangers or different or have ways foreign to others. All of us have our own kinds of poverty, emotional, spiritual, sometimes financial and economic. All of us have done wrong. All of us are prisoners of sin and greed and selfishness. All of us stand in need of grace. All of us are goats. And the truth is this too. That every one of us has the opportunity to give grace, to share grace, to offer hospitality, to include the different, to forgive the sinner, to reconcile with the enemy, to bind up the wounds of the hurting, to share with the needy, whether that's emotional, spiritual, financial, or material support. All of us can offer grace. All of us are sheep. For Christ is not in just a few good men. I say that because of the, the movie. He's not in just a few good people. Christ is in every person. And every person is family on this earth. And every person is part of God's family. Christ's family. The Spirit's family. Amen. Let's take a moment to pray silently, putting our faith and trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, we call you good shepherd. That as a good shepherd, you not only care for all the sheep, not just certain sheep, all the sheep. In fact, you even go out looking for those who are lost to bring us all home safe and sound. That all of us will have grace and mercy from you all the days of our lives and beyond. Help us to share that same grace and mercy with all. Amen. See, I think it's a hymn. Our hymn is 730 for a World. Done. 
Let us pray. God, today we pray that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. We remember how you sent your Son to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to captives, and salvation to your people. Sometimes, God, we have to admit that we don't always see good news for the poor. Sometimes it seems as if a lot of the world is blind, and a lot of the world is held captive by fear and oppression. And sometimes it just seems that a whole lot of people need help and salvation. And sometimes we want to blame, blame you, God, that you haven't done enough and you should do more. And, but maybe part of the problem why is that we don't see you at work in the world is that we don't recognize you because you're working in people. It's a tough thing for us to learn, Jesus, how you hide in the most unlikely places, how you beckon us into life and compassion by disguising yourself in broken humanity. But when our eyes are opened, we discover that we're never far from your heart, from your kingdom. And so we ask you to show yourself to us again and lead us into prayerful action. Help us to share your grief when lives are needlessly lost simply because they have no money for food or shelter, because they have no access to medicine and care, because they have no choice to believe, but to live where war and violence constantly threaten. Help us to feel your offense when the least are exploited, by the lust of those who are physically stronger, by the greed of those who are financially richer, by the disregard of those who are politically more powerful. Help us to know your pain when what you have created is destroyed by the carelessness of expediency, by the short-sightedness of progress at all costs, by the sense of entitlement of proud humanity. Help us to see your face in every hungry child, in every tired woman, in every disappointed man. Help us to hear your cry in every person who mourns, every person who's lonely, every person who is in agony. Help us to feel your presence that we might have the courage and confidence to act with compassion and love everywhere we go. Jesus, you are working hard in this world because you work in every situation where someone cares for another, helps another, forgives another, makes peace with another, advocates for the oppressed or forgotten, is on the front lines of health care or puts their lives at risk for another. Send us to tell the world that you are alive and well, Jesus, and that you're working through people. Send us to tell the world the good news of your healing love. Send us to those who mourn to bring joy and gladness instead of grief. Send us to proclaim that the time is here and now, and that you are saving people from hatred and oppression and violence and fear and captivity to sin and evil. Teach us to welcome you, Jesus, by welcoming those in whom your image is hidden and by working in our small worlds to make visible your kingdom where all are welcomed. Amen. This is a time when we normally take up the offering, but obviously we don't take it up these days. You can give it on your way out. But it's also a time for us to think of how we can serve Jesus Christ, not just with financial gifts, but with our lives.
these gifts help transform us and others, that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world to do and say and be your love. Amen. Our closing hymn today is 340, At the Name of Jesus. Lead on, O King Eternal, till sin's fierce war shall cease, and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, but deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. So go in peace. May your words be a blessing to others. May your actions be full of love and grace. May there be healing in your touch. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and your loved ones now and forever. Amen.
Have a great day, everyone. God bless you. Thank you, guys.